um, throughout uh, the talk. Or, so um, welcome everyone to the second in the series of our TVS uh, colloquia. Uh, today um, we have as a guest speaker, uh, Marc Monnier. He is a former particle physicist at the French National Center for Scientific Research where he worked on this search for the top quark with the uh, UA2 experiment at the proton-antiproton collider at CERN. Uh, he turned to astrophysics in the early 90s as a founding member of the EROS experiment, which was one of the discoverers of microlensing. Mark later also launched the subject of the interstellar installation, the topic he will describe in today's talk. So Mark has been a part of the Rubin and of the desk science collaboration since the very beginning. He contributed to the CCD readout electronics, uh, to the holographic disperser currently under commissioning in the auxiliary telescope for atmospheric calibration, and also to methods for the measurement of photometric redshift. Uh, recently, he became involved with large scale structures and cosmology with Rubin. Uh, also with radio astronomy techniques, and he's still actively involved with uh, microlensing. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Mark, and please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. It's my, thank you for, the intro, for this nice introduction. So uh, uh, hello, everybody. Today, uh, I will speak about uh, a new technique to search for a uh, for interstellar uh, molecular gas that could be part, a significant part of the, of the galactic uh, hidden mass, galactic hidden baryonic mass under the form of, uh, of molecular hydrogen, which is uh, a type of, uh, of baryons which, which is especially difficult to, to detect. So, uh, so the question is to know where are the Milky Way hidden baryons? Uh, what we know since now a few, at least one or two decades is that it is not made of machos. Can you see? Yes, you can see my mouse, I suppose. Um, so these, these hidden baryons are not in machos uh, with masses uh, smaller than 10 solar mass. Uh, this has been established by the, through the microlensing surveys in, during the 90s and, and, and more recently confirmed also by uh, the Ogle uh, surveys. And here on, the, on, the, on this plot, you see the various exclusion plots of the structures of the dark matter of the fraction. So this is the maximum fraction of the dark matter that can be, uh, that can be uh, made of structures with the masses written in abscissa. And this is the microlensing, uh, the microlensing exclusions. And you see that there is a very little space, very little room for uh, objects made of, uh, of, compact, uh, of compact objects. So the proposal that I would like to make here is to search for objects, uh, not compact objects, but diffuse objects made of molecular gas. And this molecular gas, uh, which would be a, a basically called hydrogen, a molecular hydrogen, plus uh, a fraction of 25% of helium, this molecule of gas could be uh, a major component of the galactic halo. So you see here a picture of the, of the galaxy with the halo, and you see, you barely see these blue lines. Maybe you don't see them, but it's, it's just a proof that it's hard to, hard to, to, to be discovered. Uh, so if, you, if, the, if this gas is a major component of the galactic halo, hidden halo, then uh, since it is cold gas, it has no emission lines. So you cannot detect by, by, by the emission, by thermal, by, 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 by uh, emission uh, lines. And uh, also the, the medium is, is very transparent because this is due to the fact that the hydrogen is, the, is a perfectly symmetric molecule and you have many modes that are forbidden with, the, with the, such um, um, a symmetric molecule. So no way to see it by emission or by, uh, or by absorption. Uh, this, this cold gas should be uh, concentrated in a thick disk or uh, in the galactic halo. This is a low metallicity region of the galaxy. And uh, the point is that if it makes 100% of the halo, then uh, my question is uh, 
has does anybody has an idea on the column density uh, of this gas from us to the galactic to, to, to the next galaxy which is a large Magellanic cloud so my question is what do we have an idea on the on the column density I mean the the, 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 the mass per square meter if you look at the direction of the large Magellanic cloud assuming that all the galactic halo is made of uh, of uh, is, is distributed uh, in this line. So uh, usually um, people are not, do not have a clear idea on what it is. And this is not much. This is only 250 grams per square meter. So that's the column, the column, the, equi the equivalent column from the sun to the large Magellanic cloud, only 250 grams per square meter. It's a sheet, it's the density of a sheet of paper. It's a very big sheet of paper, but only a sheet of paper. So, uh, and this is equivalent to three meter of uh, molecular hydrogen under normal conditions of pressure and temperature. So you, you would say that this is, a priori it looks very hard to detect such quantity or low, a low density or low quantity of, of hydrogen. So, well, but we have to remember that we expect, we do not expect this, this um, this uh, material to be uniformly distributed. It should be distributed into fractal structures. And these fractal structures should cover about 1% of the sky in surface. So this is a model predicted by Fenniger and Combe in 1994. Uh, so these, these objects should be, could, could be clumpuscles of about 10 astronomical unit size. And in this case, if you have, you have if you cover only 1% of the sky, you expect 100, 100 factors, factors of 100 of concentration. So you expect 1% 1, 1 of the sky, in 1% of the directions you monitor in the sky, you expect some in, one, in this 1% in this, uh, in this of, the, of the situations to, to go through three, to, 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 to go to, through 300 meters of hydrogen. So what uh, should what happens with the light when it goes through these 300 meters of hydrogen? Uh, so these crimpuscles, are, are, are they are transparent, are they do not emit light, but at least they should refract the light. And this is the, this refraction is the major the major uh, process that will make these objects observable and visible. So the elementary process that is involved in the refraction is the polar, polarizability of the molecule. So we have, uh, we have to consider this process far from the resonance and the polarizability of the molecule is the, 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 the variation of the dipole of the molecule when it is excited by, by an electric field. And it, it, this acts like, like a spring uh, we, when you induce a dipole and uh, you know you have just have to keep in mind the, 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 um, the effect of the classical forced oscillator formalism. So your, your wave is delayed and the delay is, uh, the, is the effect of the, of the optical uh, index. Okay, so there are some complications due to the fact that we are dealing with very low molecular densities, but since we are observing objects very close to the initial propagation direction, we can just consider the total uh, molecules that are encountered by the, by the light as, uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, a part which is concentrated in a, in a, in a cross section. Okay, so... Uh, the relevant numbers that are of interest to us is the supplement, the, 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 the excess of phase uh, that you get, that you expect when the light crosses this molecular uh, hydrogen. And uh, in the case of, uh, if, you, if you go, if you cross 300 meters of column density, you expect uh, about 80,000 times, 80,000 turns for the phase of the, of the light which means that if you have a relative column density fluctuation of only 10 to the minus six, you will expect variations of the phase, relative phase between two points, which have this small difference, you will expect a wavefront distortion of the order of, of one of the radian, one radian, a few radian. 
So, and if you remember, that's it's sufficient to get interferences. Okay, so Mark, can I ask a question? This is Harish. Yeah. Um, uh, a 10 Kelvin, uh, would this hydrogen be in gas phase? Sorry? A 10 Kelvin, would the, would the hydrogen be in gas phase? Would it be a it, gas? Or, gas? Would it, or would it sublimate and... No, that's, that that's, that's, uh, yeah, that, uh, that's compatible with this temperature. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so now that this is, this is a general, uh, general picture. You have a source which is supposed to be at infinite on the left. Uh, and then uh, you, this source produces a, 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 a plane wave just entering the, uh, what I call entering the, the gaseous structure that I will, I will call a screen uh, with variable, uh, variable op uh, optical path. And then the result is that after crossing the screen, the, the wave is distorted. And instead of having plane, you have a distorted wave surface. And this wave surface, the propagation of this wave surface after crossing the screen is driven by the Fresnel diffraction. And this Fresnel diffraction produces a speckle at the, at, the, at, the, at the level of the earth of the observer. And the most interesting part is that this pattern, this illumination pattern, is something that will move with the same relative speed of the screen with respect to the line of sight. Okay, so uh, we have uh, you this this speckle. Now I will describe this 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 uh, this type of speckle. We you have uh, several uh, scales here, a diffraction scale, which is a typical scale where the variation of the of the phase is uh, of the order of one radian between one point and the next point. So between two points that are distant by air, the, this diffraction radius, you expect one radiant variation in the, in the phase. And another uh, very important, uh, so this characterizes the turbulence strength. strength. The, 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 the larger the turbulence, the smaller this diffraction radius. Now, another, another radius, which is also important in, in, the, in this picture is the size of the region where you receive so you, 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 have, you are the observer here, and you see a size of a region where you from where you receive the most of the scattered signal. And this size, is, by definition, is called a refraction wave. And as you understand, this diffraction wave is only connected with the screen structure, but the refraction wave depends on the distance of the observer. And it also depends on the wavelengths. And the product between these two diffraction diffraction uh, radius and refraction radius is a constant. I will go back uh, later in, the, in more detail with these, these variables. Okay, I want to show you a demonstration. So this plane wave that I showed, I just showed before, I, I can, usually I do an experiment during this seminar, but this time I made, I made a video, so I hope that it will be uh, the, same, the same demonstrative impact. So here you have uh, this plane wave can be represented coherent wave by by uh, by a laser. The diffusive medium will be uh, made of uh, um, of plastic sheets uh, with different uh, different structures, and uh, the, the interference speckle will be the image on the wall uh, on 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 the wall of my living room. So <laughs> now you can see. I hope you will see correctly this video. Here we see the effect of a granulated plastic sheet on the propagation of the laser beam. We observe large and variable spots in a relatively small area. Now, here is the effect of a structure with a finer granulation. We see that the beam is more spread out in smaller spots. Okay, so I hope that this is demonstrative enough. Uh, I, what I just, I can now add the comment that you clearly understand why we can take, we can extract a lot of information of a diffractive, of a diffusive medium, just by looking the, the illumination pattern, which are, which are very different in the, in the two situations I have shown. 
So this is uh, this is also an animation that shows the this pattern, uh, an illumination pattern uh, that uh, that uh, moves uh, relative to the to the observer, to move relatively to the to the Earth, and you 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 clearly understand that if you have a telescope which is located, for example, somewhere here, you will alternatively receive more or less light from a given uh, given star that submits this type of interstellar. Uh, interstellar scintillation. Okay, so we made simulations of this, uh, of this, uh, of this scintillation. For this, we have first to, to simulate uh, a, a phase screen, uh, a phase screen resulting from, uh, from a turbulent structures, gaseous structures. The phase, what I call phase screen is just the total phase, phase variation that is induced by the medium when it is crossed by the, by the light. So this is a map of the phase delay for the turbulent cloud. Uh, the model used here is a tur Kolmogorov turbulence with, a, with this uh, power law, which has a slope of minus fifth third. And this is something which is realistic enough. If, uh, we have tried other power laws, but you can see on the right, this is a, on the right part is a, is a real storm cloud. So it really looks like a, uh, it's not easy to make the distinction between the two. So that's, that's a good indication that we have a realistic view. So, um, um, this is uh, the, this, uh, now this is not anymore the, the, this is not the screen. This is the illumination pattern on earth that we expect on earth. If you have a point source, perfectly point source and monochromatic point source, this is this is the, the pattern you 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 expect, and if you zoom here, you see the fine speckle, fine speckle, with the contrast or modulation index of about 100 percent. Now you have several complications in this. We never observe monochromatic. We observe through a passband filter. But here is what we expect if you go if we see through the the KS passband, which is 2.15 micrometers uh, near near infrared and what you see you do not change very much the large structures but in the small structures which is the same zoom here you start to blur the structures because you superimpose you superimpose uh, interference uh, patterns from different uh, from different wavelengths and you lose the you lose a factor of 2 in the in the modulation index the worst happens when you remember that you are, we never, we can never monitor point source, but we always monitor extended sources, which are stars. And this is, for example, for small stars, which is a little bit smaller than the sun. And uh, what you see here is that um, um, <clears throat> you, the modulation index here, uh, the, 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 the pattern, the emission patterns here, results from a convolution between the point source uh, pattern with the, with the disk surface of the, of the source. And then this is why you, you b completely blur the, the small structures and you barely see the, the largest structures and you lose a lot of modulation index, a lot of contrast. The modulation index you expect is, is now only a few percent. Now, so if you if you add both effects, extended source plus polychromatic effect, so the, the 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 fact that you are looking through a, a, a passband it doesn't doesn't cost very much in 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 in, uh, in contrast. The major effect is really the the term of special coherence. So now this you imagine you have to keep in mind that this this uh, this illumination pattern. Uh, moves relative to the to the observer to your telescope. So then you have a transverse velocity here. It's like your, your telescope is moving within this pattern. So you you are sampling this uh, this uh, this pattern, and you observe uh, this this type of light curve. This is what your telescope should detect with a typical time scale uh, that I will. Uh, it is related to the to the um, to the refractive uh, to refractive radius and uh, 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 a modulation index of the order of a few percent. 
Okay, so and now I go back on the distance case. We have four distance scales that characterize this pickle pattern. The first one is diffusion radius or diffusion or diffraction. I can I, sometimes I, I say both, but both are valid. So sorry about that, but I never could decide for myself. Uh, so this is the, the separation screen for which you have you have a one radiant difference in, in the flux, and this is characterized the the strength of the turbulence. So here is again the, the phase screen, the, the simulation of the phase screen. Uh, here is a cross section of the, of the phase along the, the red line and the, the diffusion radius is given by this distance where you have a difference of one radian. And to get one radian difference, as I said before, this corresponds to only a variation of 10 to the minus six in the column density of the, of the molecules. So this, this uh, diff, diffusion diffraction radius is given by a complicated formula, which is here with some exotic exponents that are related to the, tur to the turbulence uh, science. So, but what you have to remember typically is that it's typically a few hundred of kilometers. Okay, then uh, the other distance scale, as I said before, is the refraction radius. And this is the size of the region from where you see the most of the scattered signal. So I took a picture this weekend from a, from a, a water surface in Paris, and you see here from left and right, uh, what is the diff, this, this uh, refraction radius? I'm sorry, I put diff here, but it's ref, refraction radius. And uh, uh, what it's interesting to see that if you have a smaller diffraction radius, you have a larger the refraction radius. You have smaller structures here, smaller ripples, and then you expect the, sig the signal to come from a wider domain. Uh, then uh, we can also expect the diffuse gas structures to have larger scale structures that may act like lenses, so focusing or defocusing configuration. This is something that is observed, for example, in radio astronomy with extreme lensing events, ex extreme, um, yeah, that's extreme diffusion event. So this, the, all what I am describing here is a science also that is well known, more, more or less well known in, in radio astronomy. And uh, finally, the, the fourth and most, one of the most important distance scales is, as I mentioned before, is the projected source size. Uh, so the, the size of the, the size of the, of the, of the star. And uh, this completely smear, smears the speckle, the small speckle uh, due to the diff, diffraction with the diffraction size. And then you expect the, the final uh, the final uh, illumination pattern to result from the convolution between the speckle of a port light source with the source projected profile. And this critically impacts the contrast of the illumination pattern. Here you see, for example, the very basic, very basic explanation. It's the basic explanation of the spatial coherence. You have, a, uh, you have here the source, here is the observer, and you, you just assume a very simple a screen with just a step of, of phase. And this is, this is the, the figures, this is diffraction figures you expect coming from this point. And this is the, the figure, the other figure in, in, dotted, in dotted lines. This is a figure you expect from the other extremity of this diameter. And what you observe is the, is the, is the superposition of this. And then you understand why you lose a lot of contrast because of the size of the source. Okay, so back to the previous picture. That's, uh, I think that now uh, you have seen the way to go from this point source, uh, point source illumination pattern, a point, monochromatic point source to uh, the realistic uh, scintillation pattern that we could expect on earth. So we have, uh, so I said that the telescope should see a, 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 a variable uh, light curve from such a star, a, a star that, 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 uh, that submits this scintillation. And uh, the first observable is this ref refraction time scale. Uh, so you, 
just the ratio between the refraction time scale and the, and the apparent velocity of the illumination pattern with respect to the line of sight. And uh, the interesting point here is to see that the typical time scale is of the, of the order of a few minutes. So it's between minutes if the diffusion radius is, uh, is, uh, is a smaller to uh, maybe hours if the diffraction radius is very large. So you have your telescope here and uh, this is, oops, sorry, I, I went too fast. So this is the, the referent, the, the refraction time and the modulation index. The modulation index is the second observable, uh, which is just the modulation of your light curve. It's, as I said before, it's, it essentially depends on this, on this uh, scale, on the, on the size of the source and also on the refraction radius. And but do not depend on the details of the power spectrum of the fluctuations in the, in the screen, in the, in the gas, gaseous screen. So we, um, we, we established this theoretical formula for this modulation index. And we try to reproduce and to reobserve this theoretical formula with simulation. The problem is that the simulation is uh, uh, needs uh, for, for to, to doing correctly this modulation. You need a very large uh, to, to 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 generate very large uh, screens with a very small sampling, very small pixels. So that's why we. Uh, but but the advantage is that you can do. Uh, when you generate one such screen, you can generate several, uh, several crossing of this screen, several observations and several timelines. So what is nice to see that we have, we have a correct theoretical estimate and the modulation index is of the order of a few percent. If you assume, if you put the sun at 10 kiloparsecs, then you will expect in the red, uh, in, in the red filter, you would expect uh, that uh, when you look through a cloud which has a diffusion radius of 1,000 kilometers, you will expect 2% fluctuation uh, modulation index. Okay, so what are what will be the signature of the scintillation? Uh, you expect uh, the light curve to be stochastic, which is very different than random. Stochastic means that you have some 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 statistical characteristics that are reproducible in time and uh, random is uh, just uh, you have no correlation between uh, the between the measurements so you have you have an autocorrelation you have because you have a power spectrum so uh, you expect the characteristics time to be uh, a few minutes the modulation index can be as high as five percent uh, this modulation index decrease if the uh, radius of the star increases, that that's some the, that could be some signature also if you have a lot of scintillating events. And this modulation index will uh, obviously depend on the cloud structure and basically on the diffraction, uh, diffraction uh, radius. Uh, another no other signature for pro propagation effects about chromaticity, I would say that uh, we would we expect chromaticity only if we are able to see the smaller structures, which is uh, probably hopeless with uh, standard uh, sources. But in this case, uh, so for the short time scale variations, well, then we would expect a chromaticity variation with the wavelength. But if you look at the long time scale variation, then the chromaticity will be very, very, very weak. But the interesting uh, most interesting signature is probably the, the correlation between the light curves that are measured or the decorrelation between light curves that are measured by two telescopes, which are, uh, uh, which are uh, at large distance. So this is, uh, for example, uh, you have here the Earth, you have a, a pattern of illumination that crosses the Earth. And the, for six telescopes at six different locations, you have the expected light curves. And you see that uh, the, the the correlation in, or the correlation between the light curves decreases with the distance between the two telescopes, and this is something one of the strongest signature of propagation effect. This could not be mimicked by uh, this could absolutely not be mimicked by um, by uh, 
by an interesting variability uh, of a source because you would have synchron synchronous maxima, synchronous minima with an interesting variable source. Okay, what are the chains? Uh, how how much are the chains to see to see this uh, this type of uh, of scintillation? What is the fraction of stars that would that could scintillate? So this maximum fraction of stars, if you look to the Magellanic clouds, should be of the order of one percent. If you assume that the halo is completely made of this type of gas, so I said before that the maximum would be one percent. Now, uh, one percent, uh, you will not observe this one percent because we will not observe the. We will only observe the largest, uh, the largest modulation index. The small modulation index will be uh, under our threshold. So, if you have a threshold in modulation index, that's very simple. The maximum is ten minus two, and you multiply by the fraction of a gas which is turbulent enough to produce uh, a modulation index that is large to uh, your threshold. So we did a test, uh, we did an observation tests during two nights with the NTT for, to test the concept uh, in infrared. And we, uh, we did observations through a bulk globule, which is made of gas, but also of dust. So then we have to observe if you want to see stars behind uh, through, through this, this gas, existing gas, you need to do observations in infrared. So in infrared, we have we had uh, typically a one, one thousand stars that could be observed in infrared, and we have also the control a control sample with the sample that was outside of the of the globule. We searched for a for a scintillating star. We have found one candidate. So you see here during the low 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 luminosity and during the high luminosity, we found. Um, a star that showed modulations, probably modulations that are probably too strong to be explained by the scintillation. But it is a good indication that we have some sensitivity. And it was confirmed during the two nights, so night one and night two. Uh, and but uh, more more interesting is that from the from the low number of of variations, we were able to put limits, upper limits, and scintillation optical depth. So the first fundamental result is that we were not overwhelmed by an unexpected background, which is something important if you want to continue to do this type of science. So the upper limits and situation probability, uh, we were able to constrain with uh, limits, we were able to constrain the abundance of turbulent gas. So now I will focus on B68. We did several other directions, but B68 is the most the most sensitive direction. And this is the maximum optical depth. This, this curve shows the maximum optical depth. So that's a probability for scintillation as a function of the diffraction radius of a structure, which could be in front on the path of the light. For example, you read this like this. For, uh, if you look, uh, you want to know what is the fraction of objects uh, what, what if the fraction of the surface of your of your globule that contains gas with diffraction radius smaller than 60 kilometers, which would be very strongly turbulent. So this fraction, this maximum fraction of gas, uh, a fraction of the surface was uh, only 10%. So that's a way to exclude contribution. The, if you go to the left, you go to strong to to stronger turbulence and you go to lower turbulence on the right, you have you have basically no limitation if you look at uh, at uh, if you are searching for uh, for objects that are not turbulent. We did also a blind search uh, with stars that were in the small Magellanic cloud. Blind search in the sense that uh, we we were looking blindly if there was gas on the path of the of the light, and uh, again we were able to. Uh, and we are we we were already able to 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 exclude the, the, the uh, some uh, some quantities so in, in terms of optical depths we were we were able to um, to exclude some uh, some uh, models of the clumpuscules you know this is the model of the clumpuscules uh, if you assume that it is made of 100% of the halo this is the maximum value for the clumpuscules and uh, this is the smallest 
diffraction radius that is allowed for the crepuscules. It corresponds to the densest crepuscules. And you see that we were already able to exclude uh, a small part of these of the possible model for the crepuscules just by, by two with two two nights of observations. So we exclude that 100% of the halo could be made of crepuscules with a diffraction radius uh, smaller than uh, 70, 70 kilometers, for example. Now, the interesting question, the most interesting question to us is to know what we could do with the Vera Rubin telescope. So I showed you that we, to, 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 to search for this turbulence, for this scintillation, inter, what I call interstellar scintillation, we will need for a long series of short exposures because we, we want to have a, a, a short, uh, very fast sample of light curves. So we need short exposures from the same uh, wide field. We need a wide field because we have no ID, no clear ID on the optical depth of the process. And it also strongly depends on the turbulence. Mm -hmm. And we will need uh, a very precise monitoring, uh, very good precision photometry, so better than uh, than one one zero point zero one magnitude, which is one percent relative precision. And as I said before, the we expect uh, in in the best cases we expect the 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 the, the, the modulation to be of the order of one percent of a few percent. So we really need the best uh, photometric precision and but uh, the problem is that we, we, we need this very good precision but also on very faint stars because only the faint stars are small enough to have to, to allow for a few percent of the of the of scintillation modulation. So my suggestion is to do a movie of the large Magellanic cloud in one passband, the passband with the highest photon flux, probably G or R. Uh, so this could be done during the commissioning or co coupled with deep drilling observations. I am sure that other communities will be interested in this mode. This is why I'm giving this seminar because I am sure that other people will be interested in short time scale mm -hmm. survey on monitoring mm -hmm. of large margin cloud. So the target I suggest is the, is the large margin cloud to search for invisible gas, so these, these clumpuscules, but we could also use targets in the direction of uh, uh, on the galactic plane. The problem is that if you, if you go through a visible nebula, you absorb the light, so you need to be in infrared. Okay, this is some, some uh, of the expectations that, that, that we could uh, get from the, from the uh, some, some uh, prediction that we could, uh, we could obtain from the Vera Rubin telescope. So I, I assume here 50 seconds exposures. Um, okay, so this this is uh, well, it's not an easy an easy plot to explain, but uh, this is the an abscess how you have the magnitude of the star, and the point is that here is the modulation index you expect as a function of the magnitude of the star for different diffraction radius. So the here it's the strong turbulence strength, and here is the weak turbulence strength. And this, this modulation index decreases with the magnitude of the, when the, with the luminosity of the star, I'm sorry, the magnitude is increasing in the other direction. <laughs> so, because if you go to the right, you have larger stars. If you have larger stars, then you lose contrast, and then you lose, you lose modulation index. So this is this explains the shape of this expected uh, curve of the modulation index as a function of the magnitude. Here I have, super, I have superimposed the, LS, the, pre, the photometric precision of LSST uh, directly in terms of uh, oh here the best the best uh, photometric resolution of LSST. I, well, the 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 the, the, the fr from the from the from the science book is uh, is is um, five millimag. So this is five millimag, and this is uh, this is uh, getting worse when you go to fainter stars. And what you see from this plot is that LSST will be sensitive to structures that have a diffraction a diffraction radius 
which is smaller than 16,000 kilometers. So it's a, very, it's a very good sensitivity to, to a weak turbulence. And uh, given this, the very high statistics, the very high number of stars that is within the single, uh, a single field of, of, uh, of LSST, we can just say that uh, uh, all uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, the contribution, the, if, we, if we have an exclusion plot here, this will mean that uh, we, we will be able to, to, to discard any contribution from these structures beyond, uh, uh, below 16,000 kilometers because of the large number of stars monitored in just one field of, of uh, LSST. Well, that's the end. Uh, so the perspective is that we I showed that we need we need a large light meter telescope because, because we monitor fine stars. We need a wide field camera because uh, we don't know the optical depth. We have uh, the fast readout is mandatory to have a highly sampled light curve. So Vera Rubin telescope is perfect is perfect for this science. Uh, the technique will be sensitive to the clampuscules that induce relative column density, uh, which are slightly stronger than 10 to the minus seven relative column density. Uh, when you move uh, by a few thousand kilometers transverse, transversely to the, to, the, to, the, to the gas. So the conclusion is that, oops, sorry, just a, a, a movie that could taken during one or two nights to the second night to confirm the first night to, to where the large or small Magellanic clouds would certainly provide an excellent sensitivity to this uh, turbulent hidden ga halo gas. I thank you for your attention. And I see that there is a question by Harish, but I am not anymore the... <laughs> yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yes, there, I see there are a um, few questions already. So Harish, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Mark, this is very interesting. So the first thing I thought about when I heard uh, uh, you considering stars is why, why don't you look at quasars? I mean, they don't have the problem of being larger than the diffraction angle or the size of the diffractive scale. Uh, it's not completely true because quasars have an extension, have an extension, have an angular extension. Even very small, but you have an angular extension that has been measured. But isn't that smaller than uh, the, the radius of a star? Not that much. Uh, there, if you look at the, at, the, at the very first reference, you will see a discussion about the quasars. The point is that now uh, that may suffer from, from uh, statistics because the number of quasars per, per field is much smaller than the number of stars. But uh, in fact, there is no no miracle. You know the the, the quasar angular the, the the angular size of the emitting part of the quasar is also uh, limiting. Okay. Um, there was another question by Sri. Yeah. Um, I actually had a number of questions. Uh, okay. Uh, are you assuming that these uh, clumpuscules are absolutely only made of hydrogen and helium? I am not assuming anything. I, you know, I, I am not a theoretician. I'm just saying that if the hidden matter is made, the hidden, uh, hidden uh, bionic matter is made of molecular hydrogen plus helium, this is, this is, this is a type of, of hidden matter. No, I, no I understand the, the hypothesis, but you know, if we have to get into reality here. And uh, the reality is that we see um, metals, even at uh, great distance from uh, galaxies. So this suggests to me <clears throat> that early on, uh, there has been a lot of mixing of metals and uh, gas. And if so, they're much, much stronger uh, atomic and molecular line signatures of this clump of schools and just absorption. Uh, because as soon as it gets something like CN or CH, uh, <clears throat> or even sodium, or the diffuse interstellar bands, there's no shortage of absolutely direct indicators by just absorption spectroscopy. Okay, it's, it's, uh, yeah. uh, it's the simplest thing to look for. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I think that we have already good ideas, good, good uh, uh, there are already good measurements of this. And they don't show any evidence for uh, uh, the Klumpiskel theory, I would say it doesn't, at least yeah. in my mind, no, no, but pass the first test of actually being any, there's no indication of such Klumpiskels in absorption, which is a more sensitive test than the secondary test you are suggesting. Possibly, but uh, except if these clumper skills are, are very primitive. Oh, that, that's why I started by actually saying that all the indications are that uh, metals uh, got into the universe very early on. And my second uh, question is, uh, why not just, uh, fine, I understand that you, the larger the star, you know, it'll, it'll uh, convolve and you'll, it'll diminish the, the modulation index. Uh, we have tremendous amount of data with Kepler at the micro magnitude level. Yeah, but uh, remember me, what is the diameter of the Kepler? It's about a meter, I think. Yeah, it's not, not large enough, even, even from space. You know, the, remember that, um, that we, ah, maybe, maybe, uh, uh, yes, you if you are able to go really low in, in, in yeah the... yeah so with Kepler there are many stars and it and in, in the classic Kepler field it went on for four years so in terms of sort of your path of the uh, uh, you know the source versus the uh, but, the clump it's 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 a very long path you're cutting across yeah, okay. but uh, how how many typically uh, stars do you have like this because what I mean? yeah uh, do, are are available uh, how many how many objects like this are? Oh, the, the, I don't know, th hundreds of thousands. It it looked at an intermediate latitude field in the Cygnus uh, region, so it's actually quite well suited to uh, as a okay. test. Yeah. I, I, okay. I have to see in detail because I di I didn't check this uh, recently, but uh, at the time, uh, uh, okay, uh, there may be there may be some possibility to reanalyze things there. And Actually, the other Kepler one was, was pointed close to the disk. Uh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, but at, but at yeah. the very least, there's no reason why. Uh, so let's go back to the test that Mark did, which is a good test, which is you actually look at a Bok globule or something and actually show that these variations do exist. Okay, so in that sense, the Kepler is a control test, and test would be the real test. Yeah. Because that's true. That's true. That it's it's it, it would be a test, but it would probably not be my favor the favorite direction to 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 search for. Uh, but with tests, you can then go and uh, do for the other bright stars, and you have uh, you don't have the micro mags of Kepler, but you have ten micro mag, which is not bad. Ten micro mags. Yeah, it's a lot better than any ground based stuff. Your scintillation noise, all sorts of other things going on. The problem with ten micromags that you may suffer from the from the intrinsic variability due to spots, stellar spots, and everything like this. So you will be you will have a lot of background. Uh, I expect. Oh, Mark, uh, we can add, always add some noise if you want. It's a joke. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, there was a question as well from Rachel. Hi Mark, uh, great talk, that was really interesting. And thinking towards uh, future observing resources, I was wondering if you had considered an experiment for the uh, the Roman space mission, which will be a wide field infrared imager, larger aperture than Kepler. Um, of course, it won't launch for a couple of years, but uh, it, it will launch in the near future and it will have a substantial amount of its time dedicated to guest observer programs. Yeah, certainly you're right. I should I should investigate this, but I didn't have time to to, to go in that detail. Remember me that the size also of the Roman telescope. I believe it's two point four meters. Two point four meters. That would be probably that would be large enough, even if. Uh, yeah. Okay. Then in, especially in infrared would be interesting because we can go through the these famous bug globules. And look in uh, look through structures that are existing structures. Exactly, and the other nice feature about it is it will be available contemporaneously with LSST. And I know the two projects are looking for uh, synergies between the two surveys. So something to consider. 
so, so certainly, certainly. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Now, now if uh, that one, my well, one of my interests in doing this seminar was to try to to find people who are also interested in to to continue this subject. So, okay. <laughs> welcome to everybody. <laughs> well, we have one more question from uh, Sylvie. Yes, uh, my question is about uh, night quality. Do you require photometric nights, very good photometric nights, or uh, you can relax? Uh... The answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. The best photometry is really needed in, uh, for this type of science. But, but uh, fortunately, we, is not needed to have years of observations. You know, just one night, a few hours should be sufficient. But if you have two telescopes, ah. you can avoid this uh, requirement. Yes, I tried. I tried to. I tried to use. I made the time request with the the two Magellanic uh, Magellanic telescope Magellan telescopes. Unfortunately, but uh, you know it's not easy. You have to find, uh, you have to find, uh, you, have, you need to have good conditions in both observatory at the same time. You need to find a common field, uh, not too low on the horizon. That's okay. <laughs> it's not. It's not easy, but it's feasible, and that would be the the, the best signature, yeah, definitely. But uh, unfortunately, it was not. Uh, it was not. Uh, uh, it was not accepted, so. Okay, thank you. There is another question from Rachel. Sorry, just to follow up on that idea, I wondered if you considered using um, Euclid and uh, the Roman space telescope simultaneously. They'll be both at L2, but about 100,000 kilometers apart. Yes, uh, uh, the question may be, uh, maybe the field, the size of the field may be a little bit too small for Euclid. I have to check this. Yeah. But that, that's... it's worth checking. Yeah. yeah but that's... I was wondering if you could use that plus simultaneous observations from LSST and yeah. you could disambiguate the, um, the stellar fluctuations because you'd have um, long coverage at different wavelengths. That, that would be great, yes. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Okay, do we have any more questions? Um, I think Sylvie's hand is still up from before. Um, so if there are no more questions, um, I would like to thank you, Mark, again for this very interesting seminar. And thank you all of the members here who joined this uh, talk. And uh, I'll see you uh, well next month. We have another seminar on April 19th. Thank you and bye. Bye bye.